you want to get your Bibles out, turn to Ezra chapter 6. I should do the same. Ezra chapter 6. We've been working our way sort of verse by verse through the book of Ezra in this God is here, we are here series. So macro, big picture, cramming for a college exam the next day because you didn't read the book of Ezra. What would you want to remember? That Ezra is all about God is here and we are here and the goal of those people and the goal of God in the big picture sort of sweeping arch is that he has come to build relationships through relatable passions, practices, and places that draws people closer to God. I mean, that, that's the point and the purpose. So that's why they're rebuilding the temple, so that there'll be a place for people to engage and worship God. So when they're full of sorrow and, and struggling, what, what do they do and where can they go to find um, God or answers? Well, they could go to the temple. They could go to God's people who would help them to find their way to the foot of the throne. When things are going great and they want to celebrate and they want to thank God, like we have those cards at the bottom of those blue sheets that you can turn in. If they want to praise God for something, when they do, they would return to the temple. And they haven't lived or cared about God for decades and then they want to come back. How would they do that? So this whole series in this book is just about, look, God's here, we're here. Let's just draw you in. And that's where we're going to find ourselves in um, Ezra chapter 6. Uh, verses uh, 6 through 7. So let's just take a look at these verses and, and uh, follow along here in our Bibles or um, on the screens. Now, what's going on here is Darius is decreeing a response. Remember, um, people in the government didn't like that God's people were living for God. So they wrote a letter to the king and they're like, what do we do? No one gave them permission to live for the Lord. No one said that they could build for the Lord. What do we do, government? So they write to the king, Darius, and this is his decree. And that's what we've been unpacking is his decree and his response to those who wish to seek to rebuild and draw closer to the Lord. Verse 6. Now, therefore, Tats and I, Governor Darius, King Darius is writing this to these folks, Governor of the province beyond the river, Sheth Boz and I, and your associates, the governors who are in the province beyond the river, keep away. Verse 7. Let the work of the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild the house of God on this site. So we're getting this decree of, of Darius, and, and, and what's happening here is, is the, the people of God, and notice where it says there, let them rebuild the house, leave God alone, leave them alone, let them do what they need to because they need to rebuild. Now, here's what we know about something that needs to rebuild is because it's been left to obviously develop itself into disrepair. So it's not unlike other things in your life. Should you not keep the regular maintenance of your automobile, it will find itself in disrepair. Should you not keep regular maintenance of relationships and people that you love and care for or uh, people that you work with, then those relationships will be in disrepair. Same for your home. All kinds of things in our life are that way. So we know we must rebuild things when it has found itself in disrepair, and that's what's happening. That's why the people of God are rebuilding in these scriptures is because that's what's happened. They've drifted away from God. They had ignored God. They had not followed after God. And, and we as Christians, we're driftable people. We certainly can be drawn away and, and have our spiritual life and relationships find itself in ruins. We can be caught up in the current um, as a, uh, of culture. We can be caught up in the, the waves and troubles and, and even the celebrations and the abundance of life. So where the last place we've ever looked and the last place we ever want to go is to God and his word in prayer and in study. So that's why they're having to rebuild. They're not doing a remodel because everything's going great. They're, they have to build something that was destroyed because of their own sin and their consequences. So they're left here and they're like, man, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? So how do these people know or how can any person know that their life is headed in the wrong direction? I mean, how do you know that? Well, some of the ways that we see in scriptures, which is absolutely happening here in these verses, is unnecessary hardship or unnecessary abundance. Those are the two things that we've known since the days of Job and Solomon that the, the devil in our flesh wants to do in order to draw us away from God. It will just pile and pile and pile onto you. Unnecessary hardship. So that one day you're shaking your fist at heaven and going, how can God be God if these things are happening? Or the other way, as Solomon knew, it just piles on abundance. Allows you to live in one of the greatest countries on the planet. And just says, let me just give you. So then the last thing you ever do is go, once I follow God and he provided every good and perfect thing, to now I've, I've hacked life. 
I figured it out. And now I've got that which appeases me and that which comforts me. And when you find yourself in an overabundance or find yourself uh, in, an, in sort of an unnecessary overabundance, you must pause and look and go, why are these things happening? For what purpose does it exist? Because those two things can easily draw us into the wrong direction. And some degree of those most certainly can happen. And that's what had happened with these folks. And now they have begun to return in Ezra for that. So let me hit you with this one thing. Let me tell you this one thing. It's always the right time to return to God. What time is that? What time is that on my phone? It's always the right time to return to God. So is it now? Oh, but I've got decades of not returning to the Lord. I've lived in the abundance of life that we have. Return to the Lord now? Yes, it's always the right time. So whenever you meet anyone, for whatever excuse or reason that they have, that they have maybe far from God, the right now is the right time. So wherever you find yourself, wherever you find yourself in whatever state, it's always the right time for a greater commitment to Christ. So there is no excuse to say when we get things together or when we go, we, we do that. And, and that's what's happening in Ezra, right? Should they stop? And even the king's like, look, leave them alone. Let them do and serve and come back to the Lord. Let them push and build and go and strive after and serve after what God has for them. Because it's always the right time to return to the Lord. It, it's, it's always the right thing to do when that takes place and happens. And when you're at the gas station, right time. In your grocery store, right time. When you're at the bank, right time. When you're home on your front porch with your neighbors, right time. When you're driving home from work and stuck in traffic, right time. Which means it is the right now in which we return to him. And that's the good call that God's doing. And, and don't miss that big point. It's not like Darius is becoming so loving and, and converting to, um, you know, the Jewish faith, God is using him so that they might rebuild and reestablish a place for God's presence in there so that others may continue to return as we'll see that we saw through the book of Esther and we see in the book of Nehemiah, those people coming back because it's always the right time. Now, let me give a little context here to the actual returning to the Lord, right? Because you don't just show up and go, God, I'm just physically here. I'm spiritually here. But you return to the Lord in faith in order to fulfill his will. Let me tell you this. Yesterday, it's gone. I don't care if you've got a silver DeLorean that's powered by trash. You're not going back to the past. It ain't happening. There's no time machines. They can research. They can look. They can science it all the way out. It's not going to happen. Marty's not taking you back. It's gone. And tomorrow, we know this for some of us, not coming back. We're just not going to have tomorrow. We're not promised that. Scripture tells us. It even says don't even worry about tomorrow. It's got enough troubles of its own, but you might not even wake up this side of eternity tomorrow. This could be your last day. So we remember all of these things, and that's why the Lord's like, look, not only do you return to him, but you return to him in faith. And how do we do that in faith? Let me just Acts 2.21. Let me remind you of Acts 2.21. It says this, and it shall come to pass, because people, when they think about returning to the Lord, want to do whatever they can at times to exclude themselves from that. I'm already a Christian. I need a deeper, intimate relationship with the Lord, or I'm not a Christian. I don't believe that Bible stuff. But let me just tell you that that is not God's response to people. Here's his response in Acts 2.21. And it shall come to pass that everyone, who is that? Everybody, everyone. You can look to your left, you can look to your right, you can look in front of you, look behind you. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, shall be saved. So what does that mean? In anticipation, I, I, I think of Christ, though it's, it's probably not this way, but I, just, I, I think of Christ just, uh, just leaning forward on the throne. I see God on his throne. I see the Holy Spirit at work throughout the world just in anticipation that what? That people will return to him like a wayward son, a prodigal daughter who has come back to the family after conversion and realizes that it's, it's only God and it's only Christ that could save them and bring them back into that relationship so they return and they follow and they come that way. So God is anticipating, uh, desiring is probably a better word, for your return, for you to come back, Christian or non, that he does that. So the first way to return in faith is certainly through salvation. Now, I like real life examples. 
I like real life examples of stories where people crash and fall and fail, but then they learn from that. God gets a hold of them and does a good work and brings it out. Why? Because that's my life. All of the, the, the tears that I've cried have not been happy tears before the Lord. They have been repentant ones of confession where I've failed him and have desired to be back and, and, and return into a good grace relationship and, and through no fault of his, but all fault of my own. So we're going to take a look at several passages of scriptures here that really put that out. We can all head in the right direction, but the great thing is from Acts 2, 21 to the truth of the scripture is that we can all get back on the right path. Is that not true when you're traveling? Some people would say that we got less lost when we could read our own maps. But you've ever used your favorite map app and then 17 hours later it feels like, like, why am I in this cornfield of danger? I am in and now in a movie where I'm not getting out of this alive. Or you're like, hey, just put my thing in your GPS. But when it does it, here's where I really live. And then you give them the directions. And what we see is that we all know that that things can be corrected. That's why we coach people, we equip people, we policy people, we HR people, we share our failures and successes with people so they can do marriage better and engagement better and dating better and and their jobs and when they're learning to at play and they're learning to recharge their souls. We, We teach and we train what we know so that they can do it in a good, better way. We have that in all other areas of our life, in our spiritual life, in our relationship with God and how we live that out exactly the same way. We should be striving to help other people to realize even if you're on the wrong path, even if you've moved in in such a way that you've found yourself um, far away from God, that you can just come right on back, right? Isn't that what they always tell people when you try to read through the Bible in a year? If you miss a day, what? Just start reading up again. Don't quit. Just come back. So let's take a look at uh, several passages of scriptures here. We're going to look at the life of Peter. I love Peter because there are many times I'm just like, look, I want to bro hug you because I have been there and I've done that. And we're going to look at Peter and see how he works in this sort of a a real life example from scriptures where someone comes back. So remember Peter, right? Peter's a guy that's like cutting ears off in the garden of Gethsemane. He's like, I will die for you. I will go wherever you go. And Jesus is like, what? Before the rooster crows... You're going to deny me three times. No, 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 no way, no way, no way. Like literally the same night, he's sleeping in the garden, cuts an ear off. Then these people start coming up to him, and what happens? So, so listen to this. Here's, here's Peter, right? I mean, this, this is the guy that said to Jesus, um, you are the Christ, right? This is the guy that, that God looked his way and said, on this, church, on this rock, I will build my church. Right? I mean, just so many great moments. He's the guy that walked the water and almost drowned too. But still, I mean, we've got all these moments. So they come to Jesus. Uh, they come to Peter at the moment of Jesus' arrest and resurrection, and they're like, "Hey, um, this is just in Matthew um, 26." When they hit this, so you can understand this. They come up to him, a servant girl, a waitress. She's just trying to do her job. She's like, "Hey, weren't you with Jesus?" Denies it. Just flat denies it. Next time, a little bit later, another servant girl comes by and is like, "Hey, weren't you with Jesus? And aren't you for that?" And Peter denies it, but then he gives an oath. Right. I don't know Jesus. I promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God, which would have been super awkward when you deny God's son. It's like I'm telling the truth. Third time, somebody else comes around because he's got an accent. Southerners, we get that, right? And he's got this accent. It's like, oh, you've got to be Galilean. Listen to how you talk. You talk weird. And then he does this. He begins and he invokes a curse on himself and then denies Jesus again and says, I don't know this man. And then what happens? That rooster crows. And that's where we pick up in this verse, right? A man who had slept under the stars with Jesus for three and a half years. So in Matthew 26, 75, here's what it says about Peter, which I think we can all relate to. And then many live in this state right here. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and what? Wept bitterly. Just a crushed crushed man because we're talking hours before that actually that same evening that had turned to morning when the rooster had crowed and all of a sudden peter on the wrong path and jesus is being arrested at night and it's secretive and he's he's about to go to the cross and he's living with this and this takes place man for at least a month he's got to just handle this and go through this 
They say, man, I'm away from Jesus. Man, I'm going. And, and what's interesting is we have, we have two different responses in scriptures because not only who else betrays Jesus during this time, but Judas does. And let me tell you something. Their outcomes in their life, completely different. Judas commits suicide, takes his own life, hangs it, God spill out, and he falls to the ground. But Peter comes in this, and here's why it's always the right time to return to the Lord. So Jesus, in one of his post-resurrection moments, shows up to the disciples, and they're having breakfast around the campfire. So they, they have this, and you know, like you know everything you read about Peter from, from Matthew 26 to all the resurrection stuff that we see in First Acts, that it's just inside him, right? Because you've ever done something wrong and like saw them at work, and they know that you know you ate their hoagie from the lunch fridge, and they know it. And you're just like, man, this is awkward. What are we going to do? And every time you see them, you're like, are they going to say something? They're going to throw me under the bus? They're going to rat me out? I mean, how do I make this right? How do I get this relationship back together? And Jesus is on the scene, and after breakfast, Jesus is so many things after meals. After breakfast, we pick up John 21, 19. So right before this, around the campfire with some fish, very coastal move, um, Jesus just goes, hey, do you love me? And Peter's like, yeah, you know that I do. Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Lord, you know that I do. Third time, Peter's kind of not getting it. Do you love me? And he just, Lord, you, you know everything. You know that I love you. And then Jesus says this to him. A man who had suffered for so long wondering where his relationship stood with God and, and would really legitimately can see, can see his way out. This was said um, to show what kind of death he was to glorify God because Jesus had told Peter how he was going to die. And after saying this, what did he say to him? Follow me. Why? Because it is always, always the right time to return to the Lord. So Peter's sitting there in his own just pityness, sitting there in his own apprehension. How do I make things right with the Lord and Savior? I mean, he's risen, and I know that he's there. I saw the empty tomb for myself, Peter says. Denied him three times. Everybody knows that. What now? And he just comes and sits with Jesus. He gets with Christ, and Christ just says, you know what? There is forgiveness. There is mercy. There is redemption. Now what I want you to do, follow me. Follow me. So somewhere in these, this two-month period of time between Jesus' death and resurrection, we, we, we see all this stuff taking place, and um, right around Pentecost, we pick up uh, sort of the conclusion of this, what happens when we find ourselves drifting away from the Lord. Look, this is a message that two-thirds of the people need to find hope and encouragement in on the planet, and that Christians, the other third, need to remember that we can always return to the Lord and find this commitment to follow him, to do God's will. So now you've got this guy who was denying Jesus three times in front of all those people who were there. Not a champion moment for him. The only way that relationship gets fixed, because God gets in the middle of it through Christ and fixes it. Then we find ourselves in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. So just like immediately after the Holy Spirit comes, it fills them all, starts preaching the message, we get to the end of the message, and we see a completely transformed and different Peter in the midst of this. We had a Peter who denied Jesus three times. We had Peter who was restored by Jesus at a campfire. Now we see a Peter sharing Jesus for God's glory. And Peter said to them, isn't this the guy that denied him three times? Yeah, that's him. Yeah, that's him. See, that's the great thing about Christ and what Christianity has to offer. Your deepest, darkest wounds, your blind moments of abundance and celebration. God could transform and use that to call people out. So Peter's now saying this and will, for the rest of his life, promote this message. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then, with the heart felt totally infused, verse 39, because he lived it and this happened to, you, happened to him and, and can happen to us, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are what? Far off. Everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. And you just, I mean, I don't know if Peter's like raising his hand right now and just praising the Lord, but you know in that dude's heart when he says those words from that verse, he goes, man, I was far off. I didn't even know how to bring up my stuff. 
to Jesus. I didn't even know how to get right with him. Now Peter's standing and telling everyone, here's the way forward to repent, which just simply means what in Greek? To turn, which is where we kind of get what? Our English word, return, right? To repent, to, to come back to the Lord. So we see a good confession made in Christ, a returning to God, a glad submission to the Holy Spirit's leading. That's the way forward that we get through this. And if a guy who slept next to Jesus, if there was a guy who cut people's ears off for Jesus, can step away, drift, fall, and have a hard moment away from Christ, then certainly this is a lesson to us to say that you would never meet anyone that it isn't the right time for them to return to the Lord. There's never a moment where you can't push and call on them and just say, look, come back, read your Bible, study the Word, get in church, worship, come over to my house for a Bible study, however that plays out, but to do that thing, and that's the goal that God desires for all who He calls unto Himself, for all of those who are far off, which is a word and phrasing used for us, because that's what we say as humans, man, that person's far from God. It's been a long time since they've been with the Lord. What can a person do when they realize that their life is headed from uh, God and moving away from him? Repent, be baptized, and fulfill God's will just like Jesus did. To begin and study their Bible. To literally return back to God. And every person you meet, that is a true thing. I hope as people meet me as a stranger, when they don't know me as a, as a pastor or a person who loves the Lord, I hope when they meet me that that's in their hearts. Because I desire every day that I live to be closer to the Lord. And I would love to run into people who would encourage me in my faith and help me to understand and how to move closer. But yeah, 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 you're a Christian. You, you, of course you would think that way. But what about all the non-Christians and, and how they would think? And, and they don't want anything to do with the Bible and they won't have anything to do with that. And you know what? Here's what I'd say. Because we love people, that doesn't matter. Because who does care for them? God does. Who created them? And their mother's womb, Christ did. Who desires for them to be in a right relationship with Jesus and God? The Holy Spirit, he does. So whether or not my kids say that I'm their dad or not, doesn't matter, I still am. Whether or not people walk this planet and say, he is not my Lord, he is not my Savior, doesn't matter, he still is. He's the only way. The only truth. And we've got this awesome gift that we can help set people free. What if they looked at Peter and said, you know what? You might as well just do what Judas did because you got no hope. You got no hope. How much would have been lost and out of? Or if you, if someone looked to you who was going to invite you to church that first time that led to your salvation and said, you know what? They are crazy pants. No way am I inviting them to church to show you Jesus. What if someone knows that I know him? Forget it. No. We know we exist to bring God glory and make disciples. That's why you have the job you have, the relationships you have, the family that you have, the enemies that you have. To bring God glory, praise and credit, and then make disciples, more people like Christ. And returning to God through Jesus is an important aspect to why we exist. So based on this message, what can we do to become more like Jesus? Because that's what Peter would say. Don't do what I did. Do what Jesus did. He never denied God. Never. And they tried to get him to. He never gave in. So let's just talk about our worship. When it comes to your Jesus-centered, gospel-centered, saving grace in worship, make sure you're moving toward God and not away from him, right? And you're like, oh, I'm not, you know, I do my things and I got my routine. At least as a guy, that's how I think. I've got my times of the day that I do stuff. And if I do those, I feel like I'm good. But just had a great conversation uh, with my wife about spiritual growth. And she's just like, have you pushed cruise control? And I was like, ooh, ouch. Great question. Have I put cruise control? Because you guys, you know what you do when you hit cruise control, right? You take that foot off the gas, and you're like, oh, this is nice. Look at this just go. Look at the economy my vehicle's now getting. And I really had to think and pray over that. And I had to go to the Lord, and I was like, hey, am I on cruise control? They're just sort of drifting off for me. So when you worship, where does your worship both corporately and privately every single day at home, where is that leading you, right? And you guys know as humans, we can give it one of these, right? Like I'm still kind of looking, but really I'm pointed that way. I'm pointed that way. So you just ask the question. Ask the question, where, what are you moving towards? Are you moving towards
Lord's got it away from him. When you're out in community, man, this is so good. I love this. This is so good. When you're out in community, follow Jesus this day faithfully, even if you didn't yesterday. There's so much hope and encouragement in that. So many people want to just say, but yeah, I was this way, but we just looked at Peter's life and we could have looked at hundreds of others, really, examples. Man, I haven't been to church since this thing happened. I haven't read my Bible since this thing happened. And you know what the great thing is? God doesn't matter. God's not going to be like, you know what, whoa, wait. Before we start a relationship, God's not going to be like, I need 100 days of Bible study, then you can come into the room. God doesn't do that. Praise the Lord. He says, look, just return in those moments. So if you didn't do it yesterday, then just get right on it and start today. Don't let that past define it. And it's, it will help you so much in sharing Jesus with other people. Because right now is always the best time to return to the Lord. Here's a great way to serve others. The exact same way that Peter did and we should do too. Help others to repent and publicly share their already inner faith in Jesus. To return to God with purpose and to the purpose that he has for them. Now, I know when you hear the word repent and you're talking about sharing, there's, there's a couple things here like, oh, man, you know, I don't know if I want to put that out there on them. Look, it's already killing their soul. It's already killing their soul. Even a Christian who has unrepentant sin, it's not doing them any good. It doesn't. You've got to turn and change things. And people do that in all the other areas of their life, so just use that to connect. When things start costing more at the gas station and the grocery store, you adjust. Well, it's the same way in your spiritual life. Man, when things start costing you and start killing you, you need to repent. You need to return back to God. It's a great way to serve others, to help them find the way. And then if you run into other Christians, to encourage them to publicly share their already inner faith in Jesus. Then multiplication, one of the ways that we can live this one thing out, like Jesus, return daily to the fulfillment of God's will. So we know the passages where Jesus went off to lonely places, right? He got away from the disciples. As a dad with small kids, I get that. Sometimes I'll be like, kids, what's over there? And I'll sneak down the stairs because it's the only way I can get some privacy. And it never happens because they come find me. They're like bloodhounds. They're like, Dad, what are you doing? I was like, something better be broken. And someone better be dying or dead. Uh, can we have a banana? Jesus. Yes. So like Jesus daily returned to God's will, right? So I can't get overly mad. I know God's will is for me to, to, to example of a, a Christian dad to them. So I'm like, boom, what's going on? What are you doing? I'm reading my Bible. Get your Bible out. Let's read together. You know, stuff like that. Just simple things that can make a difference. So let me share with you the one thing one last time. Look, it's always the right time to return to the Lord. This is twofold. One, it's for you. It's for you. All of you watching online right now, live, all of you in this room, it's always the right time to return to the Lord. And you know what else is good about this? It's the, it's the third person perspective as well. For every single person that you meet, this is such good news. It's always the right time for them to return to the Lord as well, too. It doesn't matter the past. You don't have to be some great saint. Or it doesn't even matter if they're the worst sinner in all town. God's like, look, for anyone who's far off, for anyone who would come, they can return to the Lord. Just simply present yourself to them.